Hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to this week's Week in Review, two days late, but we will be talking about the seven founders of the day from the previous week. Any questions, comments, concerns are always welcome, uh, and we're going to get right through it again. It's a Saturday, so it's a little off schedule. We'll see who can make it today, and thank you if you can. Why don't we pop up our first founder, which as always, we start on the previous Friday. Uh, and it's not actually a founder. It's a Federalist, or this week, an anti-Federalist paper. We are, in this series, discussing the Federal Farmer, who, for a long time, was thought to have been uh, Ro Ro Richard, uh, Richard Henry Lee. It's not. It was probably Melanchthon Smith, though, to be fair, we'll never know for certain. Now, Federal Farmer 10 discusses what I reference here as powerless states. Now, as always, The Federal Farmer is a really long paper, uh, but he focuses on several things. Mostly, he's responding to the Federalist Papers. See, this was published January 7th, 1788, which was right about the time the Federalists, aka Alexander Hamilton, Jamie Madison, and a little bit of John Jay started publishing some things as well. So, he actually spends a lot of time in this paper responding to the federal, uh, to the the Federalist as it was known at the time, or the Federalist Papers as we commonly call them today. Specifically, uh, he's responding to the idea put forward by the Federalists that many anti-Federalists were claiming, "Hey, there's not enough representatives in the House of Representatives for the United States. There's way less in the House of Representatives than there are in the separate state governments. Why?" And the Federalist response was, "Well." You're already represented in the states, and since the states are part of this federal system, well, then you're represented. Now, the federal farmer takes issue with this, saying, essentially, no. Uh, first of all, if this really was a federal system, where exactly in the Constitution do, do the states have a check on the federal government? In a federal system, the states would be able to halt the federal government from doing something. Now, while the states certainly play a role in this type of government, uh, first of all, they have the, um, any amendment process has to go through the states, uh, any issues arising uh, with senators, the, the senators are chosen by the states at the time, so the states are certainly involved in this government, but a real, truly federal system, as opposed to a consolidated system, as they called it, or a national system, as we might call it today, well, why, why, <laughs> why are we doing this? Uh, there should be somewhere in there something giving the states their power, and there certainly, according to the federal farmer, doesn't seem to be. Now, on top of that, uh, he then continues on to discuss the, the federal duties. Another thing that the Federalists were saying was, we don't need a lot of people in the federal government because there's not a whole lot the federal government can do. The federal government can only do a few things. So, why would we give put so many representatives in the House of Representatives when you already have them in the states? Uh, to which the anti-federalist, specifically this time, Federal Farmer, in the 10th observation, says, uh, yeah, you only have a few things to do, but they're taxing everyone and creating an army. <laughs> like, those are pretty important things that can essentially, if used improperly, destroy the state governments. Uh, again, that was one of the big fears of the anti-federalists in general, was the consolidation of the state governments under the federal system. Uh, he actually, uh, I have a quote here, the federal farmer says that uh, the Constitution can, uh, has powers including, quote, unlimited power to establish a system of taxation, armies, navies, and do every everything that may essentially tend soon to change totally the affairs of the community. Uh, by which he seems to mean the things that can completely alter the world we live in, you have the power to do. Sure, it's only a few things, but they're very powerful things. Uh, meanwhile, he, <laughs> I thought this was hilarious. Uh, meanwhile, enlisting some of the things, the few things that the states can do, the many things the states can do, one of them is uh, the power to make fence laws pales in comparison to the power to uh, create taxes and armies and navies. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. And that's essentially... Federal Farmer, 
Number 10, thank you guys for coming on a Saturday. I know this is a tough day, a little off schedule, but these things happen sometimes. We are going to move on to Samuel Finley. Samuel Finley is hard to consider a real American founder because he passes away in 1766, which, yes, is after the Stamp Act crisis, but before the revolution begins. That being said, Samuel Finley is one of the most important early educators leading up to the Revolutionary War. He was from Ireland. Uh, he comes over about 19 years old to North America. He studies to be a Presbyterian minister at the Log College, as it was called, which was one of the first uh, uh, places that would educate people in the ministry uh, in North America. And it was made of logs, like a cabin, but they called it a college because it was, I don't know, <laughs> It's just very silly, uh, but he's educated there, and then he spends, this is during the First Great Awakening, which I'll remind you was leading up to the American Revolution, was the First Great Awakening, and just after the American Revolution, as the Industrial Revolution started, the Second Great Awakening starts, but Sinley, uh, Sinley, Samuel Finley comes of age uh, just as the in First Great Awakening is going on, he studies, he becomes a Presbyterian minister, and he becomes an itinerant minister or a traveling preacher and he travels around north america preaching presbyterianism which when he gets to new england doesn't go over so well especially in connecticut where they literally take him and walk him out of the colony because they don't love uh, some of the things he's saying which include teaching he believes that it is a minister's job or a preacher's job to educate the people of the community as well as help them pray Eventually, he takes this seriously and opens a school called the West Nottingham Academy. And the West Nottingham Academy is just on the border of Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, and it's, I don't, I don't, it's not around today, but its descendants as an institution are still around. Uh, it was one of the few boarding schools in the British colonies. So many at the time, most wealthy uh, families would send their sons generally to Europe to study if they could afford it but those wealthy families that weren't quite that rich who couldn't afford to go a whole trip to Europe and boarding and the schools they were looking for a, a little bit of a more a wallet friendly way to educate their children and Samuel, Samuel Finley provided that in the West Nottingham Academy now he has an amazing slew of founders that come through this school first and foremost is his nephew Samuel, Samuel Finley uh, his wife and brother-in-law pass away, and he takes in the orphan child, whose name is Benjamin Rush. And Benjamin Rush, yes, would go on to sign the Declaration of Independence, be an American uh, founder, the founder of uh, American psychiatry, uh, although some of the methods he came up with later in his career and the beginning of psychi the psychi psychiatry field, uh, some of the methods Rush would come up with are a little... Uh, we would look at them as inhumane today. At the time, they were very forward-thinking about mental health being a disease instead of a crime. As I said, the methods they came up with to cure the disease are barbaric and hard to, de <laughs> hard to uh, uh, believe, but still, very forward-thinking. Uh, now, Dr. Benjamin Rush would later actually go on to Europe, where he would work with his father-in-law to get James... I'm skipping ahead. I'm not going to skip ahead. But another person that went to the West Nottingham Academy was Richard Stockton, who would be ben Benjamin Rush's father-in-law. Uh, Alexander Martin, who would be an important soldier. Uh, William Shippen Jr. and John Morgan, who would both end up studying medicine in Europe. And they would both end up being uh, surgeon generals of the Continental Army, though they had a little bit of a back and forth. Uh, they did. They were went became pretty pretty heated rivals later in life. Um, who, who else am I looking at? Uh, John Filson, uh, was the guy who wrote a book about Kentucky early on, made Daniel Morgan a legend. I got a lot of people moved to Kentucky. Uh, Ebenezer Hazard, uh, the, one of the early postmaster generals. So the list goes on and on. And, and these are men who were trained as boys. Now, later in life, Samuel Finley is asked to take over as president of the College of New Jersey. And what we now know as Princeton University was president of the College of New Jersey. Uh, he actually helped build the educational system there through his friend, Benjamin Franklin, who at the time was living in Europe. Again, this is before the revolution. But again, the amount of founders who went through Princeton while he was there 
is amazing. You have Oliver Ellsworth, a future Constitution signer and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. William Patterson, another Constitution signer and Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Samuel Kirkland, who founded Hamilton University in upstate New York and was very integral in discussing with the Oneida Nation of the Iroquois to get them to side with the Patriots during the Revolutionary War. Uh, James Ma Manning, who founded Brown University. David Ramsey, uh, who I consider the father of American Revolutionary History. Um, Benjamin Hawkins, Thomas Treadwell, uh, and then, and then, uh, as I said, he passed away in 1766, but it's helped, what he helped build the institution into is what's actually taken over by, uh, Aaron Burr's father, uh, Aaron Burr Sr., believe it or not, was president of Princeton for a little bit there, uh, and then, and then there would be more, they would carry on the traditions that Samuel Finley instituted, and, and the list, I mean, James Madison ends up going to Princeton just a few years after he dies, uh, uh, Jonathan Dayton, I mean, I could list names for hours whose education was affected by this man, Samuel Finley. Um, and although it's hard to consider him a founder, it's hard to overlook his impact on the American founding because you would think some of that education were about rights and government and such, and that's how uh, the revolution ends up happening. I do want to note, so Benjamin Rush, who was his nephew that he adopted, interestingly enough, would later go to... Uh, Edinburgh in in uh, uh, Scotland to study medicine. While he was there, his future father-in-law, Ben uh, Richard Stockton, another student of the West Nottingham Academy, would also show up, and the two of them together, these two future signers of the Declaration, would convince another future signer of the Declaration, uh, John Witherspoon, to come to Princeton to take over as the new president after Aaron Burr Sr. dies. Uh, so, just a weird twist that uh, two of his students, who would end up in Europe, to get not his replacement, but his replacement's replacement at his second university. So, I know there's a lot of twists of words and phrases there, but a really interesting guy. And lastly, he had a great-grandson who was his namesake, Samuel Finley Breeze Morse. Better known as Samuel Morse, the person who created Morse code and made the telegraph uh, operational in the United States. So, this guy's roots in founding the United States run pretty deep. Now, we're going to bounce over to our next founder, and it's a big one. James Monroe. Now, there's hundreds of books, I would assume, about this particular person. So, we're going to breeze through several important moments in his life that developed him to president. Because everyone, a lot of people know, especially if you watch this channel, James, Mas James Monroe was president. And I talk about him kind of frequently. He's a really fascinating guy. Although, as we learned last night, I forgot his spouse's name, which I'm embarrassed about. So I'm going to look into her this week. Now, James Monroe. You might not know. He came from a little bit of a middling family, but he was able to read, which is important. And his family was well positioned enough that when the Revolutionary War broke out, he served in the Continental Army and was appointed as a lieutenant at just 16 years old. He served under William Washington, who was a second cousin of George Washington, and really the only other Washington to serve uh, valiantly, I'll say, uh, or, or at any kind of high level in the Continental Army. Now, James Monroe, at this point turning 17, goes to cross the Delaware and the battles of uh, Princeton and Trenton. And during the Battle of Trenton, there were almost no American casualties, the exception of two, William Washington and James Monroe. James Monroe was struck by what appears to be cannon fire and was so severely wounded he would have bled out if the surgeons weren't already there. There was a surgeon who lived close by who happened to be there that saved his life. Uh, it takes him out of a good portion of the war. He, he's not totally out of the war, but he ends up going back to study um, and, he's, and he, he spends more time in the Virginia militia defending Virginia instead of returning to the Continental Army. He then ends up studying under Governor Thomas Jefferson to learn the law. Not a bad guy to learn from. He's then elected to the Continental Congress, again, like 21 years old. And he's part of this young crew with James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, uh, uh, a whole bunch of Jonathan Dayton, who end up seeing that the Continental Congress isn't working. Essentially what happens is you have the... Uh, all these men are sent from their 
respective colonies, and then independence is declared, and then all these respected men who started this war and declare independence run home to their independent states to take care of business. And then the Continental Congress becomes kind of a a stepping stone for younger politicians to find their way up in their home states. So you have all these younger men coming to the Continental Congress saying, what did those old dudes leave us with? <laughs> and uh, it's it's the this time in the early 1780s that starts the momentum to, after the war, uh, drive for the United States Constitution. Now, surprisingly, Monroe's not one of these guys, actually. He is one of the men who sees some of the problems, but he is not in favor of the Constitution. In fact, Monroe is elected to the Con the Virginia Ratification Convention, where he votes against the United States Constitution. The only future U.S. president to officially vote against the Constitution. He then goes through uh, and runs for office. He runs against James Madison. For House of Representatives. You see, at the time, the United States Senate was appointed, and there were moves in the Virginia government, because many Virginians at high levels did not like the Constitution. So when James Madison tries to make a move to become an inaugural U.S. Senator, no, Patrick Henry helps to weasel him out of that, because he does not uh, like James Madison very much at the moment. Why would you throw this Constitution at us? So James Madison says, okay, crud, I'm not a part of the Senate. I have to run for House of Representatives. Imagine that. So James Madison and James Monroe run against each other for the inaugural seat in the House of Representatives in their district. And it's an extraordinary close race. So close, in fact, that James Madison has to acknowledge that there are some amendments needed to the Constitution, something he was steadfastly against until running against James Monroe, where he acknowledged the need for it, and promised their constituents that he would push for a Bill of Rights to be added to the United States Constitution. Now, I know there's not a lot that sounds like this is about James Monroe, but it is. It's James Monroe competing so closely with James Madison for that first seat in the House of Representatives that Madison has to change his mind and push for a Bill of Rights, which he becomes the primary author of and primary sponsor of. And we do have James Monroe to thank for that to a large degree. Now, Madison does win that election. James Monroe does not. But not having a job, eventually he becomes a member of the federal government anyway. Because one of Virginia's inaugural senators passes away. And James, though in his early 30s, is chosen as a replacement. Again, they were appointed at the time for the United States Senate. Madison, uh, Monroe, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to accidentally switch their names for the rest of this. I will... Pretty much only be talking about Monroe for the rest. Monroe is appointed to... Uh, thank you, Camels. I appreciate you coming in. Uh, Monroe ends up going to uh, the U.S. Senate. After two years, George Washington chooses Monroe as an ambassador to France. Uh, his old mentor, Thomas Jefferson's old seat. Uh, though At the time, it was occupied by Governor Morris. Monroe is a little bit more France-friendly, Governor Morris not so much, and during the French Revolution, it's probably good to have someone French-friendly over there, so they send James Monroe. He's there for two years, and then the Jay Treaty, John Jay goes to Britain and signs the Jay Treaty, which is fairly unpopular, and this is about the time that George Washington, for the first time since he was a child, is kind of fair, not a child, but a, a young 20-year-old politician, since the Revolution, it's the first time criticizing Washington is fair game. And people do start criticizing George Washington at this time. And Washington takes it pretty personally, especially when James Monroe comes, uh, he speaks out against the Jay Treaty. And Washington recalls him. And when he gets back to the United States, Monroe prints in the papers a defense of his actions and a criticism of the Jay Treaty and essentially George Washington. Now, uh, George Washington, of course, doesn't like this, but... It establishes James Monroe as a leading Democratic Republican, just as that party is taking shape. Obviously, Thomas Jefferson is the leader, and James Madison is one of the higher-level members of it. But Monroe, as a former Anti-Federalist who's now served in the Senate and served overseas as an ambassador, uh, serving overseas as an ambassador and working with the Secretary of State is really a great way to be an important person on the federal stage. But Monroe doesn't want that. He comes home, and he is soon elected as governor of Virginia. And he spends the full three possible years 
three one-year terms, the max permitted in the state as governor of Virginia. He is the most powerful person in what is kind of unquestionably the most powerful state in the union. This is really important because now everyone knows his name in the United States, essentially. Uh, during the election of 1800, he helps to sway uh, people to vote for Jefferson. Uh, and, and by the time Thomas Jefferson becomes president, James Monroe is on the short list of people to be the next president. There are other people on this list, of course, uh, um, James Madison, uh, uh, several people. I'm not going to go through the list. But after his term ends in 1800, his buddy Jefferson is now elected president, and Thomas Jefferson chooses Monroe to go back to France. You see, at this point, Napoleon's taken over. And Robert Livingston is over there doing a pretty good job, but there's this interesting conversation Robert Livingston's been having with Napoleon about buying New Orleans. But Napoleon's offering a little bit more, so James Monroe goes over and joins Robert Livingston and negotiates, and negotiates the Louisiana Purchase. Yes, often overlooked, future President James Monroe helped negotiate the Louisiana Purchase. When he comes back, he's now real high on that shortlist to be the next president. But, well, there's another war breaks out. First of all, uh, I skipped a little bit. James Madison becomes the next president. And it's starting to seem like Secretary of State, which James Madison was under Jefferson, that certainly seems to be the stepping stone to president at this time. James Monroe comes back and he starts helping out with the war. He is soon chosen as Secretary of State by James Madison, and now Monroe is literally in the seat that everyone expects to be the next president. Uh, he also, during the war, things go a little awry, and Monroe is chosen to act as Secretary of War while acting as Secretary of State. Now, this is at the end of the war, and just four months, about four months, maybe six months after he sits in that seat, suddenly the war is over. Uh, just about after Washington, D.C. burns, they get Monroe in there. It's a close vote because Monroe has made enemies over the years. Again, starting out as an anti-federalist and then gradually joining the Jeffersonian Republican Party has made him enemies quite naturally. Uh, now, of course, he is working there and then James Madison, eight years as president, wants to leave following the precedent. And there's an election, and James Monroe is elected overwhelmingly in 1816. During James Monroe's time as president, it is called, for the part of his first term, the Era of Good Feelings. At this point, the Federalist Party has all but died out because almost all Americans have gradually made their way over to the Democratic-Republican Party. This would cause problems in, the, in a few years later when there were four Democratic-Republican candidates uh, following Monroe's presidency, but we're not getting into that. What I want to get to is the era of feeling was so good, and there were problems, of course, uh, uh, and unfortunately it's at the end of this term that they have the Missouri Compromise, which uh, kind of has negative I impacts on slavery and the future of the United States, but he has the Monroe Doctrine, though it was mostly written by John Quincy Adams, which said... Any, I'll remind you that by the time Monroe is president, Mexico has started a revolution, uh, and most of Latin America is starting to have revolutions, and South America are starting to throw off their colonial governments. They see what we've done in the United States, and they say, we want that too. Uh, although Simon Bolivar was kind of a one-man force for a while there, but not to get too off topic. He has the Monroe Doctrine, which essentially says, Europe, stay in Europe. Uh, everything in the Western Hemisphere, the North and South Americas, are off limits. Stay out. Because of this, when James Monroe runs for president in 20, uh, 1820 for his second term, James Monroe runs unopposed. George Washington famously won unanimously, but there were other people running against him, technically. James Monroe was the only president to run unopposed because it was so obvious he was going to win. And that's where we're going to end it with James Monroe, spending a good amount of time on him, and rightfully so. <laughs> um, as you might expect, James Monroe is an extremely important American. 
he was president. Uh, we're going to move on now to Andrew Adams, a little bit, a significantly lesser known figure than James Monroe. Uh, Andrew Adams was born in Connecticut. He became a lawyer like his father did. Uh, he ends up, when the revolution is approaching, he is elected to the Council of Safety, which is in charge of the colonial militia. Uh, he ends up uh, also serving serving himself in the Connecticut militia. He rises to the rank of colonel, and eventually, once independence is declared, Connecticut creates a state government. He is sent to the House of Representatives. He spends five years in Connecticut's uh, state assembly, including a year as Speaker of the House, controlling the floor of what's happening in Congress. Uh, he's also sent to Philadelphia for the Continental Congress. And while he's in the Continental Congress, he pushes for the ratification of and signs the Articles of Confederation. Well, I know the Articles are overlooked largely today uh, as a crappy document that didn't work. That's not really true. It is the first government, and it did govern the way it was supposed to. It just had some issues that ended up uh, not being perfect for promoting the total welfare of the Union. But as a treaty of friendship, where the states retain their sovereignty, it did the job it was supposed to. He then returns back to Connecticut, and he is chosen by Governor John Trumb Jonathan Trumbull to sit on the Executive Council. Most states at this point had an Executive Council, which kind of acted as both the governor's uh, cabinet and the state's Senate, the upper house of the legislature. So he sits on that for a few years, and then he is chosen to sit on the Connecticut Supreme Court. In fact, in 1793, he is named Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court, where he hangs out for the remainder of his days. That's Andrew Adams doing it really brief. Uh, there's more I can talk about. He, like, he has a bunch of really interesting letters with his friends uh, where he is looked to for all sorts of military advice. Uh, uh, he kind of acts as a sounding board. That's the name of the article I published. Andrew Adams acts as a sounding board because most of what you read about him and people like saying, what do you think of this? What, what if we did this? And he's like, yeah, cool, man. <laughs> That's Andrew Adams, so we're going to move right along. Again, not too much on him. Uh, John Bubenheim Bayard. The Bayard family is one of those several families, like the Whartons or the Biddles, in Philadelphia. They're a wealthy merchant family when the war breaks out. Many members of the family do many significant things. Today we're focusing on JBB over here. Um, Bayard was a member of the Sons of Liberty very early on, which is a little bit strange for someone as wealthy as he was. Uh, but he did join the Philadelphia Sons of Liberty, was a leader there. Uh, as the revolution approaches, he's elected to the Colonial Assembly and is actually, um, when the revolution breaks out and independence is declared, uh, John Bubenheim Bayard helps write the first constitution and he spends time as Speaker of the House for the state of Pennsylvania. Now, he's most notable for his work as in the war itself. He was a privateer. He owned several ships as a merchant and he's actually hired by the Continental Congress to supply the Continental Army. He's one of the few people who actually gets a government contract to supply the army directly. Um, uh, he ends up losing a good amount of money. Uh, he also joins the fight himself. He serves as a colonel in the Pennsylvania militia. Uh, he serves in uh, Princeton and Trenton. He's actually commended publicly by George Washington for his service there. Uh, and then he goes back to Pennsylvania where he serves on the State Board of War um, the Continental Congress had a board of war. Many states had boards of war to oversee the operation. He was a chairman of the state's board of war, which meant he essentially oversaw all soldiers from Pennsylvania, especially in the militia. He, too, is appointed to Pennsylvania's executive council, like Andrew Adams was, which was both the governor's... Well, actually, Pennsylvania's strange, because the executive council was the governor. They didn't have one governor. They had a president of the executive council... Uh, which uh, they end up changing that pretty quick. Um, but he essentially is overseeing the war in Pennsylvania. He's basically Pennsylvania's uh, Secretary of War, although that's not the name they call the position. Between being on the council, the board of war, and on the executive council, he is in charge of Pennsylvania's war. Unfortunately, when the war ends, uh, Bayard realizes he's incurred tremendous debt fighting in the war. Uh, he spends, he sells a bunch of land to repair his credit. Luckily, he sells off the land before the speculation bubble bursts, as happened to many American founders. Uh, he does end up, uh, going to the Continental Congress for a few years, and then he retires to New Brunswick, New Jersey, after all this time in Pennsylvania, and so excited to have him there. 
uh, New Brunswick elects him mayor, where he spends for a few years before retiring to be a county judge. John Bubenheim Baird. I'm going to have a quick sip of water, if you don't mind. And let's see who's next. John Matthews. John Matthews. Another guy we're going to run through pretty quickly. John Matthews was a South Carolinian who uh, really comes to no notoriety in South Carolina as the revolution unfolds. He is a lawyer. He ends up getting elected to the Provincial Congress, which is the shadow government that took over when the royal governors were no longer being respected, but before independence was declared. Uh, once independence is declared and South Carolina writes a constitution, uh, he, Matthews is chosen as Speaker of the House. He ends up leading all the debates there. He's a leader in the state and is sent to the Continental Congress himself. Uh, after his arrival, very shortly after his arrival, the Articles of Confederation is written. Uh, he, along with Andrew Adams, signs the Articles of Confederation, but he's most known working in the Continental Congress for service on the Marine Committee. He, uh, no, he's a good organizer of military. He actually speaks to George Washington at length on several occasions about moving troops, uh, clothing troops, preparing for certain battles. Uh, he's not only, the Marine Committee really oversees several aspects of the war, uh, and he advises the Board of War. Uh, he also ends up going down back south to the Southern Department to help prepare for the Siege of Charleston. That does not go well. Charleston is seized, but Matthews is able to evacuate. He wasn't really in the heart of the battle. He was there, as I said, in an advisory role, uh, trying to say, you know, okay, let's put some troops here. Let's do this. Again, it doesn't work very well, but people don't seem to care because he goes back to South Carolina and is elected governor. And he is governor when the war ends. John Matthews has to oversee the transition from revolutionary uh, uh, community to post-war peacetime state. He does this pretty well. Uh, he ends up removing a bunch of loyalists from the states, um, and he assists George Washington in maintaining order in the South. Interesting, interestingly, after he is governor, he's then elected back to the state House of Representatives for several years uh, before making his way to... Uh, he ends up being elected to several judicial positions, pretty high-level ones, never on the Supreme Court, but he bounced around a few different styles of court throughout his later years of life. Uh, John Matthews. Ran through them really quick. These last few we've gotten through pretty quick, but that's okay, because we are going to spend some time on Lyman Hall. We did. I did a bunch of quicker founders this week, as I mentioned yesterday. My, my, my wife was out of town. It was me and the kids, so I kind of had to do a few... You gentlemen whose stories are not so enthralling. But Lyman Hall is. He signs the Declaration of Independence. It's more fun than the Articles of Confederation. Now, Lyman Hall is born in Connecticut. Grows up there. He becomes a Congregationalist preacher. Um, unfortunately, it seems that his congregation didn't care for his style of preaching for whatever reason. Uh, and it... He, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> One second, Lyman. Sorry about that. Uh, he ends up moving with his family to South Carolina. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a step. He was a preacher, they didn't like him, he changes jobs and becomes a physician. He studies medicine, becomes a physician, then at 33, moves with his family to South Carolina. They're there for a little bit with other people who had transplanted there from New England, and then he and that whole community of transplants decides to relocate again. They move further south to Georgia. Georgia, at this point, leading up to the revolution, was less than 40 years old. It was a really new colony and very sparsely populated, so there was opportunity. They moved down there, uh, and Lyman Hall, as both a former preacher and a current physician, ends up quickly becoming a leader in this community of transplants. Now, when the revolution starts getting hostile, Georgia doesn't send a delegate to the First Continental Congress. There's a lot of loyalists in Delaware because they were afraid of the Native Americans in the area, which they were outnumbered by. Uh, they were new. They were afraid of getting cut off from trade. They were afraid of being absorbed by South Carolina, which was proposed by South Carolina on several occasions throughout the Revolutionary War. Uh, and Georgia is very hesitant to join these rebellious colonies. That being said, 
the county where Lyman Hall lived, they called the county's parishes at the time, the parish where Lyman Hall lived, uh, they were Yankee transplants and extremely sympathetic to their old friends and family up north. And therefore, they decide, we want to send someone to the Second Continental Congress. And although Georgia doesn't send anyone to the Second Continental Congress, well, the county does, and they choose Lyman Hall. They send him with a note. He goes up to Philadelphia and shows up in the Continental Congress, goes, can we accept this guy? Georgia said they don't want to be here, but this guy's from Georgia. And then someone else would chime in. Yeah, well, he's from Connecticut. <laughs> and yeah, we don't know what to do. Now, fortunately, they permit Hall to stay in the Second Continental Congress as a full active member of the Congress. This is important because they were pretty quickly said, okay, we'll let him sit in to represent this community, but can he actually be a delegate? What they decided was other counties had sent delegates on their own as well, especially in New York. Uh, Suffolk County on Long Island had sent William Floyd, you have Haring and Wisner from uh, uh, Orange County, New York. So they had been, cho there, there was precedent of people that cho were chosen directly by their counties. Because of that, they said, yeah, let them in. We can use all the help we can get. This is really important. Lyman Hall becomes the first and only delegate from Georgia at the Second Continental Congress. Eventually, Georgia gets its act together and sends two more delegates, George Walton and uh, Button Gwinnett, who catch up, but they're still a little hesitant uh, when independence is being discussed. And Lyman Hall becomes the leader in Georgia for independence, and he's able to sway the opinions of Gwinnett and Walton, and all three of them vote for independence, and then all three of them sign the Declaration of Independence. Now, uh, after this, Hall returns. Hall brings his family up to Connecticut to stay with their old family because, well, Britain's starting their southern strategy, and this is a good idea, as the Hall home is taken and destroyed by the Brits. So, good thing his wife and kids weren't there. <laughs> um, now, Hall ends up going back down as soon as the war ends. In 1782, he goes back down with his family, they rebuild, uh, he, re he moves to Savannah, actually, instead of his old, where his house was, uh, rebuilds his life and his medical practice, starts to flourish again, and is quickly elected to a one-year term as governor of South Carolina in 1783. Again, another person who's governing down south alongside John Matthews, who we just talked about, uh, he, uh, I'm sorry, he was in Georgia, not South Carolina. While governor, well, John Matthews that we just spoke about is governing the transitionary period to peacetime in South Carolina. Lyman Hall is doing the same thing in Georgia. While he's there, he puts a lot of money into infrastructure and tries to revive the economy. Again, like I said, even in 1783, at this point, years in the wars all, eight years of Revolutionary War is over, Georgia's still less than 50 years old. So Lyman Hall puts a lot into infrastructure, and, and probably what he's most known for is commissioning the uh, University of Georgia. Uh, people have been working for decades toward the University of Georgia, uh, or not decades, they would continue working for decades afterwards, but he ends up being the one to commission it and set the gears in motion to give Georgia its own uh, educational system. So Lyman Hall, not only a designer of the Declaration of Independence, but arguably one of the most important forces in bringing Georgia into the side of the war with the Patriots and bringing Georgia into independence with the Patriots. But then, very important, despite only a one-year term, very important in opening up Georgia to the future, uh, education-wise, economy-wise, infrastructure-wise. Uh, Lyman Hall, I'm sure anyone from Georgia will know this name. For those of you not in Georgia, now you know the name. Uh, and that's essentially it for this week. Those are our seven founders. I wrapped them up a little bit quick. Again, we're a little bit behind this week. I apologize. Uh, I will be back to Thursday next week. Uh, I'm thinking about publishing an actual, like, each week, a schedule of what I plan to do so that I don't surprise you guys with, hey, uh-oh, like I did this week, because I do feel very bad about that, uh, and I want to give you all the content I can. Now, I am going to go live tomorrow. We're going to do a read-along of George Washington's... It's somewhere around here. I will find... I'm sure it's free somewhere on the internet. I'll give you a link to it. We'll do a read-along of... George Washington's Rules of Civility that he wrote as a kid, which uh, is part of the reason he was so pretentious. <laughs>
Uh, so thank you guys for watching. I will be back with uh, that for you tomorrow. And what do we end with here? Uh, this isn't Peace Field. This is Round Bottom. So I will give you guys a nice round bottom. And I'll be back with you tomorrow.